Okay, before I, I begin, Ryan bought some books uh, so that I could recommend them to you and that perhaps you can go together buy them or you can just order them online yourselves. Uh, but uh, this, this book is called Daring Devotions and we have read through it as a family and then there's a sequel, Daring Dependence, which we've read partly through as well. And these are short uh, devotionals based on different um, missionaries and pastors from the past, so like Hudson Taylor, Darlene Diver Rose, Adnan Judson, John Payton, etc. Uh, they're, they're very, very well written. They come with discussion questions at the end. And it's a great thing. You can read it by yourself, uh, but it's a great thing to read as a couple or even with children and uh, opens up conversation and just acquaints you with many of God's godly servants in the past and with specific applications as well to the present. Uh, so I, I really highly recommend uh, these, uh, these books uh, to you. And they'll be up here. You can look at them later. And yeah, there's 30 devotionals in, in each one. And then uh, this, this other uh, book here is put out by Bible Visuals International, which has a ministry uh, especially to, to children making Sunday school curriculum. And for years, uh, they had really done stuff for churches. And then there was a desire to do something for families. So what they have here, this is Mark's Gospel. And so uh, what, what you have, you have a, a small drawing, study one, Following Jesus means being a servant. It gives you the reading to do, uh, Mark 10, uh, 42 to 45, so that you would read in your own Bibles. And then it has talking points. So as a parent, you can, you can read through these. And they're just questions about the text, or sometimes just comments on the text that you can then uh, develop. Uh, it even has um, suggested prayer or something, and even a... Uh, a song, there's some songs in the back, and then uh, if you want to take extra time. If, there, if there's a family here and you, you don't know exactly what to do with your family worship time or family devotions, uh, this is uh, really an excellent resource because it's very simple. It's not complicated, it's not deep. Uh, a father can take this without any preparation, just open it up and begin to read it. And, and, and really have uh, a blessed time together as a family around God's Word. It keeps you in, in the Bible. So uh, they have it for Mark, and we're presently getting this translated into French. Hope to produce that in French. And they also have one that's shorter for uh, Philippians. So, and there's one on James. My uh, wife tells me as well. So those are up here, and you're welcome to come peruse those. And, and then discuss with Ryan if you'd like to, to, to buy them. Okay, I hope your discussion questions, or discussions rather, went well this morning. It's good to see that we're a little bit closer than we were. So we're moving in the right direction. Thank you, men, who, who made that possible. Perhaps you've solved already all the questions uh, in your discussions. Uh, but if not, let's take up our theme verse. You can find it in your Bible, or you can just look there on the front page of your booklet. And it's found in Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and do what? Make disciples of all the nations. So our question this morning is this. How does that great commission, have you heard that term? We call this the great commission. How does the great commission, which is to go and make disciples, intersect with your family life? That's our question this morning. Jesus said, go make disciples of all the nations. How does that work with our family life every day of the week? 
what are we to do with the disciples? Just, just notice that for an example. To start with, look at verse 20. What, what's... Um, no, no, verse 19. It's still in verse 19. You make disciples of all the nations. What do you do with these disciples? Baptize. You are to baptize them. And the them refers to the disciples, not to the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And what's the other thing to do? Teach them, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And then there's the promise that Jesus is with us. Okay? Can we keep those two things in mind? And we'll come back to it in just a moment. But we are to be baptizing them, and we are to be teaching them. Now, in the home, are we baptizing people in the home? No. Are we to be teaching people in the home? Yes, that is the point of intersection. So you already know where I'm going. I'm going to the fact that we need to be teaching in the home. But I'm going to build an argument here, okay? So we're going to take, I'm going to take you through the steps, four points, to build an argument to show that this is part of the Great Commission in making disciples. And the first point of our argument is that teaching to observe Christ's command, or commands, plural, is central to accomplishing the Great Commission. Okay, we see that just from our text. We don't have to go any further. Central to that is teaching. That's what Jesus said. And it's not just informative. It's not just sometimes the teachers at school where they give you information and they don't care whether you accept it or not. No, you're teaching the disciples to do what? To observe. So that the teaching is actually moral and it is persuasive. You're giving them teaching to which you want them to conform. This would be like a coach or or someone who, who's teaching somebody a trade or a skill. He's not just trying to teach them numbers. He's saying, no, no, look, this is how you do it. Okay, now you try it. No, no, you didn't. You see, it's that kind of teaching. You're teaching them to do. You're teaching them to observe. You're trying to reproduce yourself in the life of that disciple. Okay? First point. I think we're all agreed. Now, what is one of the primary New Testament means for accomplishing this? And we could sum it up in one word, relationships. Relationships are key to effectively or effectually teaching how to observe Christ's commands. Books are good, internet is good, recordings are good, lectures are good, all that's good, but relationships are essential. And I think we can see it at least two ways. One, right here in this text, it's seen in the very term, disciple. What are we making? He says, go and make Disciples, not clones or robots, but disciples. And the very meaning of that term disciple means a follower learner. It was very known in Jesus' day that certain teachers would have disciples. And the disciples were people that followed this teacher around and learned in his presence and from his company. Interestingly, the word Christian only occurs three times in the New Testament, while the word disciple occurs 269 times. And unfortunately, even today, when we speak about a Christian, you go out to somebody even here in Luxembourg or maybe in the country you're from, you say, are you a Christian? Well, it, it has the idea often of as a status or I belong to a certain group and Sometimes when people come to my, my, my church and I begin to speak that, to them about the Lord, they tell me they were born a Christian. 
Their family's been Christian for four generations. But disciple, just in its very name, implies a lifelong commitment to seeking after, to learning from, to staying close to the rabbi. Well, how does Jesus tell us then to fulfill this great commission by making disciples? And we see this also in the way Jesus formed his disciples. And if you have your Bibles, can you find Mark 3, uh, verse 14? Mark 3, 14. And, and notice, this is key to Jesus' uh, method here. Mark 3, 14 says that he, Jesus, appointed 12. Okay, this is important. These are the 12 apostles. Why? I would suggest, if, if, you, if you're able to do this, that you underline the words, so that, and then later in the verse, you underline the two words, and that. Okay, that, that way you'll see there's actually two things here. Jesus appointed 12, so that, and that. And what are the two things? He appointed 12, so that they would be with him. And that he could send them out to preach. Apostles means sent ones. But before they were sent ones, they were disciples. They were with him. He, uh, he chose them. He appointed them. The first thing is so that they would be with him. Why didn't he just wait till the end of his earthly ministry to choose these men and appoint them? It's clearly stated that he wanted them to be with him. And when you read through the Gospels, have you, have you ever thought about the fact that the disciples are mostly watching and learning from Jesus? They're really not doing that much. It's Jesus who is the actor, and yet they're there with him, and they're watching him, and they're learning from him. They are with him. And that shows us that disciples are not mass-produced. They're not like toys in a factory. Uh, they are individually shaped through ongoing personal contact. The truth of the gospel is transformed, or rather transferred, that's the word I want, from one life to another through a relationship. That's why uh, you can't just have an online church either. It, what's good for the family is also true for, for the church when it comes to re relationships. So for three years, these men lived with Jesus. They heard him. They would hear him pray. They would hear him preach. They would hear him in his different conversations. And he was teaching them. He was training them. He was testing them. He was quizzing them. We read about questions that he would ask situations into which he would put them to see how they would respond. Uh, he put them into a, 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 the, the water in, in a storm and, and see how they would respond and, and things like that. He would ask them questions about how are we going to feed all this crowd. And, and they matured by observing his life, his preaching, and, and his miracles. Okay, so those, those are our first two points. We're to teach. And how are we to teach? Well, God has divinely ordained relationships as a way to teach how to observe. And then thirdly, families are divinely structured for influential relationships. This, this is a gift of God. He designed families this way. What is the closest and most consistent relationship that enables disciple making? It, it is the marriage union and the parent-child relationship. God puts a human being into a home that literally can't do anything for himself. His whole world is centered around his parents. 
And when they're little, they're always saying, look, mama, look, papa, look, mama, look, papa, look what I can do. They're, they're, they're actually wired when they're young to want to please their, their parents. But where is the biblical proof for this? That families are divinely structured for influential relationship. What, what comes to your mind? Say, well, where would you find that in the Bible? I think we could say it's the whole book of Proverbs. The whole book. And would you go in Proverbs to chapter 1? Look at chapter 1 and verse 8. Okay, we're noticing here how families, God has designed families for these influential relationships. Proverbs 1, I'm going to start at verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are, great, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Okay, help me out here now. There are four actors in these verses, okay? The first one is the son. The son. Who's the second one? The father. Very good. Who's the third one? The mother. Okay, we have that here. Uh, if, you, if you look up the first verse of the last chapter of Proverbs, it says this, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. And we have New Testament examples like Timothy with his mother and grandmother. So we have the mother. Okay, who's the fourth one? Sinners, exactly. Sinners. The sinners in, in Taishu. And the, the assumption is that this will happen, right? It's not, well, maybe one day, oh, I'll send it. No, no, sinners will entice you. We could almost say it this way. When sinners entice you, do not consent. Look at verse 15, Proverbs 1, 15. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their, their path. These are the main actors uh, in, in a child's life. There is himself and all that he's going through. He has to respond a certain way. But then there's his father, his mother, and then sinners. And I really believe that we underestimate the power of sinful relationships to entice our children. Very often we underestimate the power that sinful relationships, the enticing of sinners, can have on, on our children. And so we let them form relationships uh, with, with sin, other sinners, even though they're younger sinners. And I also think that we undervalue the power of parental relationships to benefit our children. Okay? You see the two things? I think, we, on the one hand, we underestimate the power of sinful relationships in our children's lives, but I also think we undervalue the power of parental relationships in, in our children's lives. So in many places, no one is working on the parental relationship and no one's caring about the sinful relationships. That, that is the tragedy of our day. Parents are abandoning their influential world. They don't even realize how influential they have. I heard someone say, sometimes with a child, for example, a child who's already grown and outside the home, says sometimes all you have left is the relationship. But you, you keep that. And then we are not concerned enough about the other relationships. Let, let's take a, a five-year-old and an electronic tablet, okay? I say that because I have a five-year-old and, and I have one of these. <laughs> I have both of these. Who, here's a question, who will most profit from giving the iPad 
to the child? Who does it arrange and help the most? Is it the child or the parent? <laughs> yeah. I don't like to think about that, but it's really for the sake of the parent. Sadly, parents often do not want the trouble of being in constant relationship with their child. It's tiring. It's frustrating. And, and there are things we want to do on the internet. We want peace and quiet, not relationship. And so the enticement offered to the child through other relationships, even though it's sometimes just virtual and, and, and YouTube, they often profit the parent and make life easier on him or her. You know, many years ago, I remember hearing about this, that there apparently was this ad that would come on at night and say do you, to the parents, do you know where your children are? And so it's, it's in the evening and and your children haven't returned yet. Do, do you know where your children are? The, the implication was parents should know where their children are. But what happens today? You can have four kids and, you know, th this one through here is maybe off in, I don't know, Tanzania. And, and this guy over here, he's off looking at a football match or something. And, and this one over here, he may be off communicating um, with somebody else. And, and the parent has no idea where his children are. No idea. Um, you know, it, it's hard work. It, it's hard work to get up. Sometimes I'm, I'm in my seat and I, I just, it's, it's hard work for me to stand up and go ask, what are you doing? Where are you? What are you visiting? Where are you surfing today? And, and it can lead to conflict. And so a parent's natural choice is just to let sleeping dogs lie, as we say. To, to just leave things. And, and, and sometimes there are parents who are even scared to ask their children where they are or go into their phone and look. And that really is, is a tragedy because we're losing our children to virtual relationships of which we don't even know, know what they, they are. And sometimes parents will complain that a child does not want to have a relationship with them. But we must ask if the parent really wanted to have a relationship with the child while he was growing up. Or were we always trying to distract our children from us? Babysit them from us so that we could have peace. It's like I heard a parent say once, I spent the first 12 years trying to get my child to be quiet and then the next 12 years trying to get him to talk. Uh, and, and if we always forcing our children away from us, we, we are training them as they come into teens to form relationships outside the home. We should not be surprised when our relationships with them are so weak once they get older. So all that to say we must nurture family relationships. Relationships are important. But what do you do to build family identity? To build family loyalty and love and, and nurture within your family? Can you go home and say to your family, you know who the, my most favorite people in the world are. And then point at your wife and your children or your husband and your children. Can you really say to them, of all the people in the world that I would rather spend my evening with, it's, it's with you. Does a family know how to spend an evening together? Or are they all off surfing in different worlds? So we must nurture family relationships, but why? Why? And then we come to our fourth to, to really uh, bring in the argument now. Family relationships are to be used 
to fulfill the Great Commission through teaching to observe Christ's command. This, this is the ministry that is given both to the church and to the family. I remember a few years ago seeing um, a news clip in France when the teachers were on strike. And so there was no school. And it showed this mother, and she was very angry. And she said in an angry voice, It's not my job to teach my children. She was angry about the strike, but that was her mentality. It's not my job to teach my children. I give them to the state. We, we do that as well with the church. It's not my job to teach my children the Bible. I give them to the church. But we must realize that it is our job. That we are all to fulfill the Great Commission. And if we have a family, the teaching is to be happening within the home. And the key New Testament passage to all of this is Ephesians 6, 4. Uh, could, could you go there? Because we'll come back a little bit later to this verse. But this is really, really key to understanding the link between the Great Commission, where it says teaching them to observe, and the role of the home. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and what? Instruction of the Lord. It cannot be more clear than that. Parents, especially fathers, have this role to teach and bring their children up in the instruction of, of the Lord. And when you do that, you are fulfilling the great commission. There are many men who give much time, much labor to go outside the home and, and seek to advance in, 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 in their job and in their career, and yet they have no energy and no desire to develop and grow their family. And yet that is your greatest prize. And that is your greatest uh, privilege in fulfilling the Great Commission. So I now have three applications to, to this. And the first application is that we must accept the central role and responsibility of the family in the making of disciples of Jesus Christ. And I'll just say a word here about marriage, and then I'll move on to, to children. In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, it talks about the husband and the wife, and how the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her. So we see there even, even the husband has a disciple-making responsibility towards his wife. And in 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about how even, even an unbelieving husband can be in a way sanctified, set apart by a believing wife. There, there is an influence between husband and wife that should be for our spiritual good. I remember when I was in university, an older man said, one way you will know the person you should marry is that that person encourages you to be more like Jesus. That you find them building you up and you find you can build the other person up instead of tearing each other down towards the world. And, and couples should think seriously about this and talk about this. How can we walk with each other more into greater Christ-likeness? But in Malachi, you don't, don't have to look for, for this verse but it explains that one reason God made marriage 
was to raise up godly seed. It, it says, and what was God seeking? It talks about the, the marriage partner, the wife of your covenant. And it says that God was seeking godly offspring. And God is seeking godly offspring from the marriage covenant. Now that comes from the last book of the Old Testament. But we actually reread in the very first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, that Adam and Eve were commanded. We saw this yesterday, so we won't read it again. But they were, it was actually a blessing. The Bible says God blessed them, right? The, the commandment was a blessing that they should multiply and fill the earth with God-fearing, God-loving offspring, with godly offspring. But sadly, they rebelled against their creator. And their very first offspring became a murderer. It's so tragic. Their very first child. And ever since that fall, what began as paradise, the family was in paradise, has really turned into a battleground. The family has all, this is nothing new, my friends. The family has always been a battleground. And praise be to God that as soon as the gospel, as soon as the good news was needed, God gave good news. And what was that good news? It comes in chapter 3, verses 15. And, and God promised that a Savior would come. Remember that? But the Savior, he said, would actually come through Eve. It would be her seed. And so what that meant was that parenting became essential and central to the salvation of the human race. They had to have children so that the seed could come. And when you read the opening chapter of the New Testament, Matthew, you'll see how God's promise of a Messiah came through one generation having a child and they had a child, 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 until finally the Lord Jesus Christ is born of a virgin. But parenting, producing offspring, would not only be central to bringing about the coming of the Messiah, but it would be central in bringing sinners to the Messiah. So you really have two things here, okay? First of all, I, I was looking for a nicer way to put this, and I couldn't come up, come up with a better way. But parents make disciples by having children. By having children. And if you can come up with a more eloquent way of saying that, you can let me know. Eve had to have a child. What if Eve refused to have a child? There'd be no Savior. And yet we learn that even after the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he still wants to populate heaven. How is that seed going to come if children are not being born? I heard just last week that one in every three babies born in this world today is born a Muslim. And I'm sure you've heard about how the, the, the demographics of France and other countries in Europe is so rapidly changing through one simple factor. What women are having babies and what women are not. And we just forward this two or three generations and it's going to change the entire demographics of Europe. Parents must, parents make disciples by, by having children, and parents make disciples by bringing their children to God. Okay, we, we see this in the, in the life of, of Abraham. In Genesis, uh, for example, find, find Genesis 18, but I'm going to quote first to you from Genesis 28. Through parenting, Abraham was told that he would be used to bring about the promised Messiah, right? God told him in Genesis 28, 14, and in you and in your seed or your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
So it was through his descendants that the Messiah would come. Okay, but also through parenting, he would be used to bring his family to the promised Messiah. Look at Genesis 18, verse 19. God speaking of Abraham here, Genesis 18, verse 19, for I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to do what? To keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and judgment. You see those two roles? God was going to use them to bring about the seed, but also to bring that seed to the Lord. And what can be said of Abraham as an individual could be applied to Israel as a whole. Israel was a vessel through whom the promised Messiah would come to earth. But Israel was also chosen to be a light even to the Gentiles and even to their own offsprings. And one of the primary means, look now at Deuteronomy 6. This is another verse you probably know well, but it's essential to this point. Deuteronomy 6 Verse 7 says, You shall teach these things diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. See, central to their role was that they taught them. And then notice also Psalm 78. Maybe you can go down to Psalm 78. Look at verse 5. We see that God had a plan through which to keep the knowledge of himself and his commandments alive to each succeeding generation. And the central to that plan was not a ritual, okay, but a relationship. You understand the difference? God created not a ritual, but especially a relationship, a parent-child relationship. Psalm 78, verse 5, says he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. That the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. See, what is God using? Fathers to children to the next children. That they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. You see how central the family is to that. It's not for the church to have babies. And it's not even for the church to be the primary actors in bringing those growing babies to the Lord. And so in the New Testament, when we come to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, we realize that the family, by God's design, plays an important role in that. That is a structure that God has designed to enhance the Great Commission. And how do we do that? Well, in part, by having children and then bringing those children to God. You know that children are mentioned in the very first sermon that Peter gives in Acts? Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children. And for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. You and your children. The, the assumption here is that if you don't have children, God did that. Now, I, I want to be real careful here and, and say that we must be careful. I want to be careful not to disparage couples to whom God has not given children. Now, that, that's almost in every church, almost in every setting. God and his wise design and choice has made some so that they do not have marriage, they remain single, and others, though married, do not have a children. And they're just as much a part of the church and just essential to the church as, as anyone else. And we're grateful for them. 
But we must be equally care careful not to disparage those, or put down, those who have many children. And let's just take our culture, okay? Let's not talk about the church, let's take our culture. One couple walks in with no children, okay? They, they go over here. Another couple walks in with 10 children. They all go over there. And then we play the game we played last night. Okay, if you'd rather be married with no children, come over here. Or if you'd rather be married with 10 children, come over here. Where would you go? What, what would society disparage more? You know, I, I don't think it's, we know, it's, it's 10 children. Be like, how, how are you going to pay for all of this? And, um, we, we must have a positive view of, of children, even many children. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, we know had at least seven children. And even though that's not cultural, it is a wonderful thing if God allows a couple to have many children. All this to say that the Christian family is central to fulfilling the Great Commission. And, and we must keep that in mind. Obeying, really, the, the Great Commission as parents should orient all we do. Our, the discipline of our children is not to make us happy or so that we get well viewed in society, but so that they can serve Christ as, as adults. And we, we educate them not so that they can get a good job, but develop them to be the best followers of Jesus they can be. Someone put it this way, we have to work hard to prepare our children not for graduation day, but for Judgment Day. And, and I think that's important. A, a parent can be, really by what he's always telling his children, we want good grades, you want a good job, you, you want a good diploma, and we're telling them what? The most important is Graduation Day. Well, really, we, we could relieve a lot of the fears of our children if we would tell them what we say we believe. Look, seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. Have you ever quoted that verse to your children? That's the message they need to hear from us. Seek first the kingdom of God. So accept the central role and responsibility of the family. Don't just take them to church. Realize you have a central role in that. And the pastor can never replace the role of the father. The Sunday, whoever teaches them this children's class on Sunday can never replace the role of a mother. This is your role. And in fact, when you just take any church, sometimes you'll see great differences between the children. And you realize that correlates not so much to the church they attend as to the family in which they live. So second application, be aware of major pitfalls or obstacles facing the formation within the home, facing disciple making. There are dangers. There are dangerous tendencies that will be encountered because of the nature of this specific uh, training ground. Um, that, that, that will not be facing others. For, for example, I, I, can, I can come here and I can speak four sermons and leave and you may never hear about me again and you may have been profited if, if what I said was good. Okay. But my children, they, they may hear a whole bunch of sermons from me but because they live with me and they see me, and they observe me, that there are more dangers that I have in teaching them than I have in teaching you. You understand that? I mean, 
I, I can pretty much tell you whatever I want to say, and uh, you're not going to follow me home. But, but they live with me. So, so there are pitfalls that are unique to the fact that you, you, you live, you live together. Look, look at Ephesians 6, 4, uh, if, if you're back there again. Notice how it starts. Before it says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What does it say? There's a negative. Did you see that? Fathers, what? Do not provoke your children to anger. But bring them up. And, and the Bible doesn't give a list of all the things that can provoke our children. And the differences between families and cultures are really such that it would be impossible to make a list. But I think there are at least two things common, especially in fathers, that are true in every age and in every culture. And I just want to point out two dangers. And, and the first one is right here. It's alluded to right here when it says, don't provoke your children to anger. What provokes to anger more than anger? Anger, when an iron strikes against iron, it, it provokes flashes. There's a danger of sinful anger. Now, God is a God of anger, right? So anger in and of itself is not a bad thing. In fact, God will be showing anger for all eternity. But anger is in itself a destructive force, right? Right? It it's, it's destroys. That's what hell is. It's God's anger on people. And a dad with an uncontrolled anger is destroying and tearing his children down at the very moment he should be building them up. So let's just imagine. I'm sure no one here is like this, but imagine this. There's dad on the couch. He's on the sofa, he's watching the television, or he's, or he's on the internet. And the children are fighting. He just ignores it. Why? Because he's too lazy to get up, or he's too taken up in what he's watching. Does nothing. Happens again. Does nothing. Happens again. Does nothing. The, the, the volume in the home begins to mount. Now the neighbors are hearing this as well. And, and the, the dad maybe he turns up the TV a little bit. And then all of a sudden, it went too far. Bang! He gets up. And the children know that dad is either ignoring us on the couch or he's red hot with anger at us. That is destructive. That, that's using your authority for yourself and not for God. That is provoking our children to anger. My father, when he would discipline us, I, I remember this almost every time, he would send us to our room, tell us to lie down on the bed, and he would not walk in with us. He would wait because he would stop and he would pray. And after he had prayed and made sure his spirit was calm, then he would walk in and discipline us. And so, really, I, I, my older brothers, because my, my dad grew, we saw my older brothers say they remember my dad getting very angry at them. But by the time I came along, I don't remember my dad losing his temper at all with me. That, that was what he did to control himself, and God bless that. But what is avoided in Ephesians 6, 4 is unnecessary and unscriptural provocation. It, it is not ignoring the conflict. And that's the other danger. There is what I'm going to call the danger of a lack of involvement or the danger of disengagement. Th this is when... The, the father says, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get angry, so I'm just going to do nothing. And there's a couple good men who were failures in this area. 
1 Samuel 3.13. 1 Samuel 3.13 speaks about the priest Eli. And God says, I have told him that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. What a tragedy. 1 Samuel 3.13, that he knew what his sons were doing and he did not rebuke them. He actually, in chapter 2, had talked to them and said, it's not good what you're doing, but God doesn't consider that as actually rebuking them and forcing a change of behavior. And there, there's another one in 1 Kings 1, verses 5 and 6, that is really sad as well. Because this is David. This is the man after God's own heart. And he has a son that he names Adonijah. Adonijah means Yahweh or the Lord. Uh, no, yeah, well, Yahweh is Lord. Uh, you have both Adonai and Yahweh put together in that name, Adonijah. It's, it's, it's a beautiful name. The Bible says he was a handsome man. But in David's old age, he tried to seize the throne from his father and especially from his brother. And 1 Kings 1, 5 and 6 says, Now Adonijah, the son of Higgith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run before him. And verse 6 says, His father had never crossed him at any time by asking, Why have you done so? See, the Bible actually tells us that David never displeased his son by saying, why have you done this? In other words, David would literally, when he talked to his son, he would calculate his answers. And he would say to himself, will this displease my son if I say it this way? Will this upset him? Will this make him angry? And if he thought it would, he chose not to say it. You know, I, I don't think I would have really believed this before being a parent myself. But you, you can come to fear your own children more than anybody else. You, you, prize so, you want so much to be liked and to be accepted and not to be condemned as a bad parent that, that you, you end up calculating your answers to make sure it's going to please your children. In fact, someone did a, a study in... Um, many uh, preachers in the United States sadly have come out and changed their position on homosexual marriage. And, and someone went through, I haven't actually read this but I heard about it, someone went through and looked at all these different pastors that had said, well, I'm not against it anymore. And, and what they discovered is that in almost every case the pastor had a son or daughter or grandchild that began practicing this lifestyle. In other words, it was actually the influence, this is suggesting that it was the influence of the children on the parents that led the parents to actually change their positions on such fundamental values as homosexual marriage. Isn't that interesting? How out of fear for our children we can change our own principles. And, and that is not good for our children. That, that's provoking, actually, of them. and does not lead them in the way of the Lord. So the nature of the family enhances the danger of certain pitfalls. Am I speaking here? I could be an angry man, and I could still give some benefit to you. But an angry man with my children, that's, that's going to cause a problem. Hypocrisy as well is another one. Application number three. So we move on. We should use the proper tools that God has given to the family for making disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, and this we find as well here in Ephesians 6, 4. We are to use the discipline and instruction. Now, this is very important. I think it's good to underline these next three words. Because both discipline and instruction are modified by that little phrase which says what? Of the 
Lord. That means it's whose discipline? The Lord's discipline. And it's whose instruction? It's the Lord's instruction. Not mine, not my culture, but God's. They're both His. His discipline, His instruction, His education of Him. This is His great commission. You see that? What Jesus said, teach them to observe all that I have, what? I have commanded you. We, we find it right here. Fathers, okay, the instruction of the Lord. All that the Lord has commanded. That's your job. You're fulfilling the great commission when you use the Lord's instruction and His, His discipline. It's here that we get the word uh, pedagogy from, from this Greek word. Uh, and, and when you go back to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you find the same word, translated discipline here, 26 times in Proverbs. Hear, my son, a father's instruction. In the Greek translation, it's the same word. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. Now, notice that reference. We already saw that verse. What was the first word of the verse? It was hear. Okay? What does that tell us? It shows that this is verbal. So parents are to give their children the Lord's words. The Lord's words. The Lord's words. Okay, that's all throughout Proverbs. Let me read you Proverbs 4, verse 1. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father. And give attention that you may gain understanding. It's the instruction of a father. So when you see this word discipline, even here in, in Ephesians, it's speaking a verbal instruction. Do we talk to our children? When we're sitting by the way, when we're walking, etc. Do Are we speaking into the lives of our children? And of course, you know that the natural response is to be opinionated, too opinionated to listen. You can be very little and tell your children, tell your parents they're wrong and be convinced of it. And that's why Proverbs 13, 1 says, a wise son accepts his father's discipline, including the verbal discipline. But a scoffer does not, and what's the verb there? Listen to rebuke. So, what should be going on in our homes? A lot of talking. A lot of talking. Mothers and fathers talking about the Lord's way to their children. And a new subject comes up, it's a great opportunity to apply the Lord's teaching to that new subject. I remember one time here in, in France talking to a father, well-respected church leader, I was younger, I had younger kids, and I said to him, um, it was because of the context that came up, it was appropriate in the context, but I asked him, how did, how did you do to, to teach your children about godly sexuality uh, in, in this culture, in France? And he got a little bit embarrassed, and he said, well, to be honest, he said, I've never talked to my children about sexuality. He said, but, but they know. But they know. And I thought, the TV talks to them about sexuality. The internet talks to them about sexuality. Their teachers at school talk to them about sexuality. Their friends at school talk to them about sexuality. But mom and dad never talked to their children about sexuality. And even said, well, you know, my culture. And I understand. We all have cultures. But we're Christians. Above all. And we must address all these topics with our children at age-appropriate levels, of course. But what if the son or daughter refuses to listen. Well, Proverbs says, do not hold back 
discipline from a child. And we say, oh, that's more verbal discipline. Well, no, it says, although you strike him with a rod, he will not die. So discipline in the family context is not just verbal, it's also physical. Okay? Parents are to apply the Lord's chastisement. And, and we, we cannot change the hearts of our children, right? But we still have a duty to restrain them. Someone compared this once to a police officer. said, you know, a police does, officer doesn't say, look, he's, he's a criminal, he's, he, I can't change his heart, so just got to let him steal. No. Police officer has a role in his job as a police officer to stop the action. And as parents, we say, I can't change their heart. No, we can't, but we can change their actions. And God expects us, because if not, we're allowing them to harm themselves even more. This involves physical chastisement. And uh, if you go to Proverbs 23, okay, I... I, I just quoted verse 13, where it talks about physical discipline. But if you look at the immediate sentence right before, Proverbs 23, verse 12, you'll get the context. It says, apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. And then if that doesn't work, well, then you apply the rod. So you really have two things. In English, they, they both start with R. R. You have reproof, that's verbal, and then you have the rod, but that's, that's more physical. So, and, and, but the one comes before the other. Begin with the reproof. And why do we need this? Proverbs 22, 15 says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Our children are born foolish. Do we believe that? They're born foolish. They're born Pagans. Time as a family, we were listening to a preacher. And the preacher said, that little, cute little baby you have, it's nothing but a viper in a diaper. <laughs> and that's true. We need to realize that. And that, that's, that's what we're dealing with in, in every one of our, of our children. Because folly is not just a mental illness. And folly is a moral senselessness. It's this insensitivity that will ruin the child if it's not corrected. And it's not primarily due to his environment. It's primarily due to their hearts, what's inside of them. The, the Proverbs, we'll go over this, but the Proverbs uses five different words for the fool. And they really range from just a naive person who, who's always willing to try everything once. But the problem is there are certain things you can't try once, Right? Say, so, well, I heard that drugs are bad, but let me try it. Or I've heard that jumping off the cliff is bad, but let me try it. There are things you can't try. A, a naive person has to be informed before they try it, or it will hurt them. And, and children, they, they cry as though they can't survive the discipline, but the truth is they won't survive without it. And the Proverbs describes these catastrophes of children that grow up into adulthood without this discipline. They become lazy. Proverbs 10.5, they can become companions of prostitutes. Proverbs 29, verse 3, they could end up stripping their fathers and mothers and pretending it's not a sin. Proverbs 28, verse 4, they may even be violent with their fathers and drive away their mothers. Proverbs 19, verse 26. And all this is because of folly. This moral senselessness was never removed from them. So this, this, this teaching involves verbal instruction and rebuke, but it also involves the rod of discipline that will save their soul from Sheol. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. So when this is done lovingly, this is actually a mark of love. And I just told about my father that when he would spank us, he would pray and then come in. And though I didn't feel it at, that way at the time, I can now look back and realize and understand and appreciate it was actually love on the part of my father. And some of the most serious warnings come to children who mock his father and his mother because you know that you can have the best of upbringing and still rebel, right? 
Isaiah 1, God says, I've raised up children and they've rebelled. If God, if that can happen to God, that can happen to the best of children. And Proverbs 30, 17 says, The eye that mocks a father and scorns a mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out, and the young eagles will eat it. There's a special judgment on young people who turn against and scorn the teaching of, of their, their family. So family relationships are used to fulfill the great commission through teaching our children to observe Christ's commands. And Paul, he, he acknowledges this about Timothy. He acknowledges that a big player in Timothy's life was his family. First, second Timothy 1, and again in verse cha chapter 3. He insists even that a leader in a church be able to rule his own household well. He calls fathers to specifically raise their children in the faith in Ephesians 6, but as well in Colossians 3, 20 and, and, and 21. Uh, so let me close by asking you this. Have you thought of your family in the light of the Great Commission to make disciples? Have you mothers thought about the fact that you are making disciples of the nations when you're teaching your children to love and fear and obey God? You are fulfilling the Great Commission. And fathers, when you read through Proverbs, what is the primary role of a father in his home? Don't say it's to provide. It's actually not to provide. That's important. It's essential. But the primary role of a father in the home is as teacher. Fathers, do we consider ourselves teachers of our children in the ways of the Lord? And so we use, we use the tools. We use God's word. We use God's discipline. We use prayer. Bible reading. We use other people. We invite other people into our home. We're always thinking, how, how can... You know, one thing my parents would do, they would invite people over, and if they were Christians, they would ask them to give their testimony around the table. And my sister, she was eight years old. That's how she came to Christ. We had someone at her table. The people were there. said, how did you come to Christ? And in front of the as children, she, she shared a testimony, and, and God used that in the life of my sister to, to bring her to repentance. Many things like that that God can use. So make disciples of your children. I'm done.